Well, the immediate action is fuel, that it provides an alternative fuel to the brain, to glucose, um, and the brain instantaneously can switch from using glucose to ketones. The apparatus is there. They've, they've looked as early as the 12-week fetus. You know, the enzymes, everything is in place to be able to use ketones. Um, and it's still there in people with Alzheimer's. And I think the immediate response we saw with Steve was prob- probably related to fuel. Welcome to the HVMN podcast, your resource for evidence-based nutritional strategies, cognitive performance, and fitness science. Thank you for joining us this week. Fat is fuel. That's a common saying within the keto community. This podcast episode focuses on how the statement applies to the brain. You may know that, in fact, fat cannot be directly used by the brain. But if fat is converted into ketones, then it makes excellent brain fuel. This is important because as we age and in some diseases, the brain can no longer use glucose effectively. So, could ketones be useful as an alternative source of fuel? That is the genesis of Dr. Mary Newport's story. Dr. Newport's husband, Steve, battled with Alzheimer's disease until 2016, the time of his passing. During Steve's battle, his condition responded dramatically upon the consumption of exogenous ketones, particularly from coconut oil and ketone esters. Dr. Newport often described the response as seeing the light come back on in his eyes. Jeff and Dr. Newport discussed the proposed mechanism of action behind her husband's treatment with exogenous ketones, what to look for in coconut oil and MCT oils, and what the root cause of Alzheimer's really might be. Dr. Mary Newport, thank you so much for taking the time to come onto our program. Oh, you're welcome. It's nice to see you, Jeff. (laughs) Yes, great to actually see each other. I know we've spoken on the phone a number of times, so great to actually connect live. Right. You play a very interesting, important role within the whole exogenous ketone space. Um, I think, you know, one specific highlight is first authoring one of the seminal ketone ester uh, case studies on the application towards an Alzheimer's patient, um, your your husband. And might that might be the first entry point that we should kick off the conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, I know you're a, a, a doctor by background, but not necessarily a ketone expert per se. How did you get into the ketogenic space um, and, and your story there? My story uh, in that regard goes back to 2008. So I'm a neonatologist. So that's a physician that takes care of sick and premature newborns. And I practiced in newborn intensive care units for 30 years in Florida. So far afield from Alzheimer's. (laughs) But my husband, Steve, uh, developed early onset Alzheimer's with symptoms starting when he was only 51 years old. And it, you know, it just continued to snowball um, and we got to 2008, so seven years later, and he um, was really on a downward spiral. And we were pretty desperate, and there were very few clinical trials available, and he wasn't qualifying. Uh, but then two drugs came along that you know uh, he could try out for, and he was scheduled two days in a row. And I happened on a press release about a medical food that was going to come out in about a year uh, that turned out now it's called Axona. Um, but it was still being studied, and it said that it improved the memories and cognition of nearly half the people with Alzheimer's who took it. And didn't say what it was, what it did. So I found their patent application online, and I learned all of this really interesting research about Alzheimer's as a type of diabetes of the brain, that there's a problem of insulin resistance, getting glucose into brain cells. And if you could provide ketones as an alternative fuel to the brain that that could potentially improve people with Alzheimer's disease. So I was fascinated and I knew what MCT oil was. Uh, This product was MCT oil, medium chain triglyceride oil, because I had used it in the newborn intensive care unit in the late 70s, early 80s. We used to add it to the feedings of our tiniest preemies. And uh, then they started adding it directly to the infant formulas and they still do today. Um, Medium chain triglycerides are in human breast milk. Babies go into ketosis when they're uh, born, if they're strictly breastfed. Um, and ketones help build the brain. They become building blocks of the brain for the newborn um, of the lipids and cholesterol in the brain and also provide fuel. And they need an amazing amount of fuel to fuel that very big brain <laughs> the newborn does. And you know, so very important in the newborn. And so um, I thought, okay, well, this is something I could do you know, for him. And I didn't know I could get MCT oil over the counter. And I learned that it was extracted from coconut oil. So the first thing we did was actually use coconut oil um, 
which is the richest source, natural source of medium chain triglycerides. So um, it just happened that he had a day before and a day after we started coconut oil because he was scheduled for these two clinical studies uh, testing and they were in two different cities and he had a dramatic improvement in his score from the day before to the day after he took um, coconut oil and it was, you know, really fascinating Um and I thought, well, is this for real or did we just get lucky, you know, that he scored, you know, had a better score, but decided to keep it going. And it was very obvious over the next four to five days for him. He was what we would now call a dramatic responder. <laughs> He's somebody that, um, I mean, he became much more alert, more talkative. The animation came back in his face. He said it was like a light switch came on in his head the day he started coconut oil. And he said that over and over. And then we started um, eventually adding MCT oil to try to get his ketone levels higher. And I was reluctant to give up coconut oil because um, it has many health benefits. Um, it, uh, the lauric acid and it kills bacteria, viruses, mm -hmm. other things that could possibly contribute to Alzheimer's. Um, we, we, I just didn't know, and I didn't want to take a chance of stopping that. So I started mixing it, and he actually improved quite substantially over the first year. Uh, he improved so much that he was able to work as a volunteer in the hospital uh, where I worked uh, in the supply warehouse. He helped deliver supplies. He would put stickers on supplies, and then um, he leveled off You know, for another year after that. And so we're at the two-year mark. And he did get into a clinical trial. He was on the placebo for the first 12 mm. to 14 months. So he had a whole bunch of testing. I mean, he improved quite a bit on, on cognitive testing, on functional testing uh, during that year. Um, and then he did level off. And then we think he was actually on the medication. It was a crossover study. And he was probably on it for five to seven months. And he started declining after about two years and just some new things that we were seeing. And he was having side effects um, that, you know, from what we learned later was that he was actually on the medication. And I actually took him out of the study because they were very significant side mm -hmm. effects. And then it turned out that drug accelerated worsening of Alzheimer's. <laughs> yeah, we That's found terrible. out a few months later. Terrible. So this is the point where the ketone ester comes in. That's as fast as I can tell that story, by the way. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't want I don't want to rush the story because I think that it's pretty incredible that you saw this clinical, I guess, the data around Exxon of this food and you reverse right. engineered the patent to realize that this was medium chain triglycerides. Uh, I mean, just just stepping back, I mean, I mean, obviously, your passion and, and your love for your your, your, your husband, I guess, sparked that. But I'm, I'm curious, anything else that sparked, anything else you tried, what zeroed you on specifically on ketones as an intervention versus, you know, there's a number of things that people say could help you or could help someone with Alzheimer's. We were trying all different things. Uh, for one thing, we had already two years earlier um, started, uh, we swapped over from what I call the conventional uh, diet <laughs> or the, the convenience food diet yeah. because we were very much into easy foods, packaged, frozen foods, eating fast food. You know, they, they don't teach you about nutrition in medical school. So right. I didn't really know anything about that. And um, that I read a study about Alzheimer's and that the people who ate the most Mediterranean-like diet lived four years longer on average than people that ate the least Mediterranean-like diet. And then I thought, wow, nutrition could have something to do with this, you know. So we actually switched over, both of us, you know, to a Mediterranean whole food, you know, whole grain diet um, in 2006. So about two years before we started, um, you know, before we started the coconut oil. And, and another thing, too, was DHA. There was about to be a study of um, DHA, 900 milligrams a day, very important omega-3 fat for the brain. And um, I thought, you know, why would we be in a clinical trial when we can get this over the counter and risk that he would get placebo for an essential amino, I mean, essential fatty acid. So um, I put him on 900 milligrams a day. So he was probably for about two years, we were doing all of that. And I was keeping my eyes open. You know, there are other supplements you hear about, phosphatidylserine. Um, there were, uh, you know, over time, even before and after the coconut oil, there were a number of things we tried. And the only other one that I ever saw any difference that I thought I could attribute to the supplement was D-ribose, mm. uh, which is a very interesting. It's a sugar that you make from glucose within cells. You don't 
make it outside. It's not made outside of cells. It's made within cells from glucose, and it's part of the ATP molecule. And I thought, okay, well, that makes sense to me. And his he like his flow of conversation uh, improved very substantially after a couple of days of taking that. But that's the only other supplement I ever had, um, you know, tried for him that seemed to help. I mean, just also just stepping back into that era, this is almost, this is over 10 years ago. I think today, keto, ketogenic diet, the, the term keto is 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 essentially viral. It's, it's everywhere. It's the, uh, the Google search trends are growing exponentially. But 10 plus years ago, Nobody knew about it. Right. And ketosis is probably mm-hmm. a term for ketoacidosis where people oh, would say yeah. this is a poisoned state of the physiology. Right. Don't do that. This is dangerous. Yeah. yeah. I'm curious to rewind the clock here and get a sense of when you were putting your husband on a ketogenic diet, supplementing with coconut oil, which is, you know, saturated fat, all this stuff. Did you get any pushback? What were your considerations? Do you think that you were... Uh, doing something wrong. I'm curious to go through your analytical process as you decided to go on coconut oil, MCT oil, and then eventually try out this ketone ester. I was aware a little bit of the ketogenic diet from medical school. They mentioned it for epilepsy, mm-hmm. you know, that it was a last resort for epilepsy, but, you know, that it was unpalatable, it was very hard to follow, and, you know, that was really all I knew about it. And I, I did have one patient while I was a resident that was on a keto diet for epilepsy. Um, this was in the 1970s. 70s. And, um, but other than that, I hadn't heard, you know, uh, really much about it other than like Atkins diet or something like that. Um, when, uh, when I first read that this is extracted from coconut oil and I'm thinking about going out to get coconut oil, <laughs> you know, I thought, well, it's in health food stores, but I always thought it was supposed to be the artery clogging fat, you know? Right. <laughs> Right. So, but I thought, you know, on the other hand, his brain is dying. His brain is dying from Alzheimer's. And what are the chances that starting coconut oil would, would cause a heart attack before he would die from Alzheimer's? So, I mean, that, that was my thinking at the time, risk versus benefit, which every doctor does with every medication they start, they have to consider both. And I thought in this case, if ketones could help revive some of those cells in his brain and get him functioning better again, or maybe keep him from getting worse. It's worth trying, you know? So, um, that's where I was at and I, I bought it and I started reading everything I could about coconut oil. And I learned very quickly about the health benefits. I figured if it was in health food stores, there must be some health benefit and there are, there are numerous health benefits and it's, you know, this whole thing about saturated fat is really, um, completely, uh, blown out of proportion. It's it's based on really flawed science. And um, uh, in uh, I think all three of my books, I have a chapter dedicated to that, right. discussing the real studies, um, not the um, pretend. There were cherry-picked studies that they used to come up with this from the 1950s and 60s. Right, the epidemiological studies that a lot of people have criticism on. Yes, so, um, so nobody knew about ketones. When I would talk to doctors about it, their first reaction, like you said, was diabetic ketoacidosis. And there are many medical textbooks that just out and out say ketones are harmful. Right. You know, when I've gone to Asia, they say, but our medical textbooks say ketones are harmful. Well, if you're in the range of diabetic ketoacidosis, you got there because you had no insulin, very high blood sugar. That's a very abnormal state. And this is nor- usually a type 1 diabetic. It can be somebody with type 2 diabetes. It's often when they become diabetic and they don't know it yet that this happens. Mm-hmm. Um, it can happen in other situations, but very abnormal. And the ketone levels become uh, many times higher than what you could possibly get from coconut oil or MCT oil. Um, so, you know, we're talking 0.5 millimoles versus 10, 15, 20, 25 millimoles. I mean, vastly higher levels. So, you know, fat's breaking down very quickly. The body's unable to buffer it, you know, and levels are that high. But your body can buffer, you know, a normal nutritional ketosis, you know, uh, in the physiologic range. Yeah, and I would say my analogy for why ketones are there is that it's sort of like the ambulance for your energy. Because Mm -hmm. in a type 1 diabetic, there's no insulin production. The body cannot use sugar for energy. So therefore, the body is forced to use fat and produce ketones for energy. 
because there's no insulin to backstop the ketone production, then ketone rates escalate. But really the purpose of ketones in that system is the ambulance. It's trying to repair and fuel the cells. And it just happens to be that there's no sort of like kickback loop. So the ketones themselves are more like ambulance. You're not blaming when there's an accident. The ambulance obviously is going to be there, but you're not blaming the ambulance for causing the accident. The ambulance is there to try to rescue the situation. And I think in early science where people didn't understand the physiology, the ambulance there, the ketones there, are, are, are I think were blamed for uh, for not the full understanding of what's actually going on there. I agree with you on that. And yeah. um, some di type 1 diabetics are even using ketogenic diet to control their blood sugar, yeah. which seems ironic, you know, because diabetics, you think uh, they're the ones that need to, to worry the most. But um, there's um, Dr. Uh, well, he's... Um, um, Andrew Kutnick, he's at University of South Florida. He's yep. given presentations on this, and he's been able to uh, amazingly control the fluctuations in his blood sugar and keep them really fairly close to the normal range um, with 75% insulin by going on a ketogenic diet. Mm. That's where it's interesting where typically, as you mentioned, type 1 diabetics are deathly scared of having high ketone levels. And it sounds yes. counterintuitive that, okay, we'll put someone mm -hmm. on a ketogenic diet, but if you can manage it well, then that might be an interesting solution where you don't need to be just jamming insulin all the time anymore, which is an interesting trade-off. Right. Diabetes is a sugar problem. And if you don't eat sugar, you don't have to. It's not that big of a problem. Yeah. So going back to Steve's Steven's story, um, so you tried coconut oils, you tried MCT oils, and that I imagine would bring up his blood ketone levels to around 0 0.5, 1.0 millimole, that sort of range, right? Yeah, probably in that territory. And he was getting a lot of it. I mean, you know, um, the medical food was going to be 20 grams of MCT once a day. And when we measured Steve's ketones, his level peaked at 90 minutes and the ketones were gone at three hours. And I thought, well, what does his brain do the other 21 hours? <laughs> so <laughs> that's why I started uh, measuring, you know, with coconut oil, the level peaks around three hours and it's lower but it lasts longer. And right. so I thought if you mix the two together and give it three or four times a day, he could have ketones available 24-7 and then just started pushing up how much we were giving him. So he was getting a, a huge amount, 9, 10, 11 tablespoons a day of wow. coconut and MCT. And then he stopped eating so much carbohydrate. I mean, he put away the fruit and he wasn't eating the bread and the pasta and the rice. And so he, I think effectively he was on a ketogenic diet. His levels could have been higher, but we just, um, I don't think the device was out yet to measure them. Um, right. The other measurements we had were uh, done at the NIH by Dr. Veach. We mailed him samples and he mm. <laughs> had, uh, measured his levels at that point. Wow. One of the things that strikes me, and I think a lot of people that have used MCT oils or cooking oils would, would, you know, one of the common mishaps is having too much and causing GI distress. It sounds like obviously Steve built up a, quite a bit of tolerance to have that much MCT oil, but curious to hear your perspective on mm -hmm. that tolerance and how do you find yeah. the balance between having enough of the ketogenic fat to produce mm -hmm. ketones versus uh, upsetting someone's stomach? That's been a very common problem, you know, with the uh, the medical food since it's come out. They find about one in four people have trouble tolerating the 20 gram dose that they have. And mm -hmm. we were fortunate that Steve tolerated, it was over two tablespoons of coconut oil. I was trying to give him, I kind of calculated how much coconut oil he would need to equal the dose of the medical food. And I came up with 35 grams, which is a little over two tablespoons. And he tolerated that the first time. But some people take one teaspoon and they have diarrhea. Yeah. So we were fortunate it because that would have been the end of it, you know, yeah. if he hadn't tolerated it. And we found with the MCT and coconut, we had to go up slowly. If we did go up too fast, he would get diarrhea, you know, and we'd have to back off for a while, wait a couple more weeks and then inch it up even slower. And, you know, over time we were able to get, get the dose up, you know, quite high. But, um, you know, some people struggle with that. Even a quarter teaspoon of MCT oil is enough for some people to send them into the bathroom for like a couple of hours. It's yeah. incredible. We've done a, a couple of pharmacokinetic studies of MCT oils in the office at HVMN and a couple, I just remember a couple of our colleagues, I think Zill might be one of the colleagues actually, uh, spent quite a bit of time in the toilet yeah. <laughs> after that experiment. <laughs> yeah. So I guess a caveat to some of the listeners who might be wanting to implement uh Mary's protocol here 
that that might be a consideration. Start slow with a lower dose and then ramp up as you build tolerance. And eat it with food. Right, eat with food and it's not <laughs> yeah. uncommon. It's not that you're getting poisoned necessarily. It's probably a sign of your stomach not being adapted to having such high fat con- content all at once. But something that can be built up in terms of tolerance. Yeah. So how did you come across uh, Dr. Veach, NIH, the keto nester? Um, and uh, curious to get the the story and how you came across the world of exogenous ketones. So instead of having to eat uh, ketogenic pre fats to have to, to produce ketones endogenously, uh, mm-hmm. what is the story in terms of finding that you could consume these ketones exogenously? Dr. Veach, when Steve improved with the coconut oil, probably within a few days, I called him. I found him on Wikipedia. For some reason, his phone number was right there. <laughs> which was amazing. And he picked up the phone when I called. And um, I asked him, I said, um, do you think it is possible for someone to, um, with Alzheimer's, to improve from just taking coconut oil, you know? And um, he was like, oh, no, no. He said the levels would be much too low. You need much, much higher levels. And um, and then he mentioned that the inventor of the um, Axona product had talked to him like several years earlier and asked him the same question about MCT oil. And he told him, no, it, it's not going to work. The levels aren't high enough. And But I already knew that it did work <laughs> you know, at that point. For Steve, it's, it seemed to be working. You know, um, It was either the biggest coincidence in the world or – you know, it was doing something for him. And so um, I thought, okay. So I kept reading and reading and reading. Uh, He sent me, I think he sent me a couple of his articles about the ketone ester. He mentioned the ketone ester. Mm -hmm. He said you would need much higher levels and, you know, that he had been working on this ketone ester since the 1990s. He told me about some of the studies they had done and, um, you know, that he lacked funding, you know, from the NIH to mass produce it and do clinical trials for Alzheimer's. And, um, they were mainly looking um, at it for um, uh, Department of Defense for the troops yep. to see if it could help improve their physical and mental endurance. Um, uh, and so, um, you know, uh, we left it at that that first conversation. And then um, when Steve, the day before the coconut oil, when he did not uh, qualify for the study, the doctor had him draw a clock, which is a test for Alzheimer's. Um, and he drew this, it was a few random circles, not a big circle even, a few little random circles and a few numbers. And um, she said, it's very disorganized. It looks like he's on the verge of severe Alzheimer's. And um, that was scary. That that really was my impetus to say, we're going to pick up coconut oil and see if we can do something, you know, anything to help him. Mm-hmm. And um, so, Two weeks later, he drew another clock, and this time, full circle, all the numbers were there, and he had numerous hands of the clock, like dozens of hands of the clock, (laughs) and it was so much more organized. You know, it was messy, but it was just amazingly better, and I faxed the clocks. I called Dr. Veach, and I faxed the clocks to him. And then he called me back and he says, well, this is unexpected, he said. Those were his words. This is unexpected. Um, I really didn't think he didn't really think the levels could be high enough to help somebody. So he was fascinated and he sent me more papers. And within the next 24 hours, I got calls from the uh, three, you know, of the researchers, physicians and researchers who were interested in ketones and they had written hypothesis papers about it. And this was Dr. Theodore Van Italy, Dr. Sammy Hashem, and um, Dr. George Cahill Jr., who had discovered Mm. that during starvation, your brain is fueled off of ketones. Um, Two-thirds of the fuel supply to the brain is is from ketones. So they all called me within 24 hours and I didn't know who they were or how important they were, but it was, to me, it was just amazing. I took notes, you know, when I talked to them, I was trying to learn everything I could. And How did they find your contact information? Was it... Dr. Veach gave it to him. Okay. He gave him my phone number and told him to call me and they all did. Yeah, George Cahill's uh, seminal paper, Starvation of Man, is an interesting paper. I, I think... It, it was, I think just for the folks that are listening, one of the key results was starving, uh, I, be, I believe, theolo- the, the, theology students for 40 days. That was the second study. The first was a, a heavy, uh, an obese nurse. Right. Who, she was our first volunteer, and she, right. it was for 41 days. Yeah. yeah. 
which I don't know if you could pass ethics approval to in the modern right. day to starve someone for 40 plus days. But that was some of the interesting research to show that, yes, you could uh, fuel the brain with ketones and ketones would actually be the predominant fuel for the brain in that kind of starvation state, which is obviously all kind of the underpinning framework that, yes, uh, you can fuel the brain with ketones and glucose or sugar is not a required substrate for brain function. So I, I stayed in touch and I still, you know, talk to Dr. Veach um, once or twice a month on average, I would say now. And, um, you know, so then my big thing was I got to I have to get this message out. There are 35 million people in the world dealing with Alzheimer's and not to mention also Parkinson's and ALS and MS and, you know, diabetes, you know, um, all of these people could potentially benefit from this ketone ester that Dr. Veach had, you know, and maybe in, be, you know, before that, you know, in the meantime, use coconut and MCT oil. So, um, I wrote an article that, um, I started writing to politicians and media people, really got no response. I was trying to tell them, you know, about Steve's case study, but this is about a medical food that's going to come out in a year, but it's available on the shelf. It's coconut and MCT, but there's this ketone ester that Dr. Veach is working on. He de he needs funding for it. So that's this needs to get studied urgently, right. you know, and I, uh, Alzheimer's Association, you know, I even, I went to their conference. I was, I had uh, written up a case study. Um, it's available on my website from 2008, little case report about Steve that I was going to present and try to get the researchers interested there and in studying ketones. There were 5,000 people from all over the world attending this conference. And mm -hmm. um, first the Alzheimer's Association approved me to have a table and then they didn't. <laughs> They pulled the approval about three days before the conference, and um, so I met. You know, I went to Chicago anyway. I attended the conference. I snuck as many to people as I could <laughs> of the um, the article, but they were not going to stop you from spreading the it's message. It's crazy, and I had chats with them at various times. You know, this is just a food. <laughs> you know, the MCT and coconut, and there's this ketone ester. Why aren't you funding this? And they said, well, you know, why aren't you telling people about it? It's just a food, and they're like, well, it needs. Uh, clinical trials, you know, before we can tell people about it. I said, but you're the guys that fund the clinical trials. Why don't you do a clinical trial? And they just, you know, weren't doing it. But, you know, um, I think they had gotten proposals, you know, probably from Dr. Veach and, mm -hmm. you know, to um, try it, but they just hadn't done it. Um, and um, so that was very frustrating. And, you know, I ended up doing a grassroots approach then. Yeah. So I, I presume at the time, the uh, this was late, uh, 2000s, early 2000, Eight. so 2008. Yeah, this is still 2008. Yeah, two months after Steve. So the amyloid tau plaque thesis was oh predominant was predominance, and as you fast forward now into 2019, all these uh, neurological programs attacking that pathway have failed, and a lot of the big drug companies have pulled out of the neurological programs because the targets for pla uh, amyloid, plaque, tau have, have have not worked. So, so I guess this is in the heyday of when this was, I guess, a relatively new hypothesis. This is where all the funding was going to. This is where all the academics were focused on. Yes. Okay. And you should have seen the size of their exhibits at that conference. <laughs> Um, Exona actually had an exhibit there and, um, I went to them and I would say, so what is, what is in your product? And they would say, oh, it's a powder. And I'm like, no, I mean, what is the active, you know, and it was like pulling teeth to, to, for them to say it was MCT oil, right. you know, which was interesting. And I thought, you know, if they're not going to tell doctors and researchers what's in their product, nobody's going to understand it, much right. less use it, you know? So I just felt like they were going to have a tough time. Um, and they, I think they did, <laughs> they might still be struggling, you know, out there uh, with it. But, um, you know, so um, I, you know, Dr. Veach and I were just constantly talking at that point. And um, one of the things we decided to do was to go visit my representative. Steve and I visited her locally, you know, uh, our representative from Congress mm -hmm. and um, to talk about this, how, you know, um, this needed urgent attention, you know, for funding, you know. Um, and so he and I, and uh, Dr. George Cahill, we went together to Congress and visited um, my representative, Ginny brown Waite. At the time, uh, we were uh, standing in the hall outside of where they had just voted <laughs> on something. It was, I mean, one of the most amazing days of my life. And, um, you know, it didn't 
get anywhere. You know, she was very interested. She actually had somebody in her office that started doing that approach. Um, a friend of uh, one of the people that worked in her office who started talking again after not talking for almost a year. Wow. It was incredible. And so um, then, you know, I said to Dr. Veach, do you think I should write a book about this? <laughs> you know, um, maybe if I write a book, I can get awareness out about ketones, about the ketone ester, and maybe that will get funding. And he said, yes. And it took me about 16 months to to write it. Um, you know, I'm working full time. I'm taking care of my husband with Alzheimer's. I would get up really early in the morning and spend two or three hours writing before he woke up and before I had to go to work. And um, I had, there were so many papers. I mean, it was surprising really at the time how much ketone research had taken place. Um but there was a lot of other, you know, uh, stuff I had to research, you know, like if I would get a, an article from Dr. Veach, I would read, get the articles and read the articles, you know, related to that, that were important. And um, so, you know, the middle, uh, my first book was called Alzheimer's Disease, What If There Was a Cure? The Story of Ketones. Mm -hmm. uh, it took forever to get published. It took about a year and a half after I wrote it to actually come out, <laughs> which was very frustrating. Um but it was long. It was 500 pages, I think. Wow. And, um, you know, I just wanted to really get it right, too. And it actually did pretty well. It did pretty well. And um, the 700 Club, uh, which uh, <laughs> they invited us to do, you know, a story. So they came to our house. They filmed it. It was a little five-minute story about ketones. Um they talked to Dr. Veach, and they had an amazing little thing about how ketones work, you know, a little video showing how ketones are taken up in the brain, and that went viral. That, you know, um, uh, they said they had 5 million views that year of, wow. um, you know, pretty quickly, most of them, you know, after they aired that on their show, and um, so that got the message out, and people are still using it. Um, so people that sell the ketone salts constantly use that video to, right. to uh, the people that haven't heard of uh, ketone salts and what they can do. Um, so, um, you know, that, you know, really I was just obsessed with being a messenger and, you know, writing about it was part of that. Um, so, you know, I probably had part of the book written – by the time Steve started the ketone ester, and it was a secret. It was a secret at that point. Um, it was Dr. Veach, you know, considered a pilot study of one person, and um, he could only make enough for one person in his lab. It wasn't available um, to anybody uh, else at that point. Yeah, I know it's, you know, one of Veach's lab uh, research scientists is mm -hmm. hand making this. Yes. Drop by drop by drop. Yep. Yeah, a few milliliters yep. at a time. He worked on it every day. And um, so what happened was, you know, Steve started having those side effects that we, uh, I, you know, were most likely due to that clinical trial medication that failed, uh, you know, and accelerated the disease. And um, so he started doing some strange things that he hadn't done before. Even though in other ways he was doing pretty well, he would put his clothes on backwards. Hmm. And uh, one day we were standing in the mirror. This was horrible. Um, and he said, you know, he said, I can see that's you. And he said, this is me from the neck down, but from the neck up, it's not me. It's somebody else. And wow. I thought, what? That is strange. And that was the beginning of him being um, confused by mirrors. He would see his father when he'd look in the mirror. We actually had him grow a beard <laughs> because then he didn't look like his father. It was, and it worked. <laughs> so he didn't recognize his own face, basically. He didn't, he didn't re recognize his own face. And that's a common problem with Alzheimer's. Mm. It's so strange. And he started wandering from home. His his brothers lived about 700 miles away, but he'd, he'd start wandering saying he was looking for his brothers. And, mm. you know, um, he, he kind of deteriorated in his ability to function. And I had to start talking him through things like shaving and taking a shower. And I mean, when you talk somebody through with Alzheimer's, you have to say, okay, now get your hair wet. You're standing in the shower. Okay, now put some shampoo. Now rub it around. Okay, now rinse it. And step by step by step, the whole shower. And same thing with shaving. And, um, you know, it was just, it was startling that that was happening. And so um, Dr. Veach and I talked about it and he said, well, you know, we finished toxicity studies. Um, it went well, you know, 
people didn't have adverse effects. It was um, approved, you know, um, uh, the FDA, you know, I, I think recognized it maybe for use for five days or something at that point. Right. The earliest grass status. Yeah. So what, what, what year was this? April of 2010. And um, so Dr. Veach said uh, that, you know, he had taken himself to test it <laughs> to make sure it wouldn't kill somebody. He yeah. said, he's, he's such an interesting man. I love Dr. Veach. He's my hero. He really is my hero. And he said, I'm going to send you this. And he said, I've been wanting to send it to Steve, but I wanted to wait till the toxicity studies were done. And um, it's the time now, he said. You, you can't imagine how amazing that was to us to be the first people, you know, somebody with Alzheimer's to get to try this ketone ester. Yeah. I've been writing about it. I've been telling every people. I've been trying to get funding for studies. And and here we were, you know, the first people to get to try it. And it was just incredible. And, you know, so it arrived on our doorstep, you know, in a um, uh, ocean spray cranberry bottle <laughs> sealed up that taught uh, – um, Todd King had put it in and, yeah. um, that's how we always got it. <laughs> and, um, we had the raw material. Basically we had the pure raw material to work with, yeah. which tasted horrible. It tasted like, you know, jet fuel. It might even taste worse than jet fuel. I don't know. It was, it was <laughs> bad. And Todd said, you know, they had tried various things, you know, there in their lab, you know, different flavorings and things like that. So he suggested that I dilute it one to four, you know, three parts water to one part ester, and then just see what I could do with it, you know, to try to flavor it somehow. You know, we tried so many different things. It's come a long way since those early days of the raw yes. ketone ester. I mean, I think it's funny to, that people call it or compare it to jet fuel, because my question is mm -hmm. how they try to drink jet fuel, how they compare that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, coconut oil is actually jet fuel <laughs> and like they can use it 10 percent of the fuel is, is coconut oil did you know that hey listeners if you're enjoying this episode thus far please consider writing a review on our itunes page it really does help increase the visibility of our podcast that's really the best way to support our work in appreciation for your review we'll hook you up with 15 dollars of hvmn store credit we also love it when we see you guys share our episodes that you've enjoyed on your Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. And we often reshare those posts. Just tag us at our handle, at HVMN. Now, back to the show. I would describe the raw, raw ketone ester as a weird blend of a liquor shot with some astringency and some smell like acetone or, uh, or nail polish remover. Combine those kind of together. And the worst tasting thing you can possibly imagine, <laughs> you know. I had um, like different family members, they would try just a tiny sip of it and they said, I will never take that again. <laughs> because the aftertaste too, it would leave an aftertaste in your mouth. I mean, I tried a full doses of it a couple times, you know, because I wanted to see what Steve might feel like, you know, right. maybe while he was taking it. Um, and um, I was like, oh my gosh, this is really bad. I'm just, it's amazing that he can drink this. And and um, he did shudder every time he took it, he shuddered, but he was such a willing participant. He knew he had Alzheimer's. He knew what he had lost, you know, what he could could do before and could no longer do. He was always aware of it. And he was a willing participant in all this he couldn't wait to try it yeah and um so he um i videotaped him for two hours before and, and when he took it and then after and um i watch it every now and then to remind me um <laughs> because it was such an amazing day and um he was euphoric <laughs> he was just felt great and he um hadn't been able to say or write out the alphabet, you know, for like uh, a few months at least, you know, before that. And he took, he spent 20 minutes, which in and of itself was amazing for somebody with Alzheimer's, but he tried and tried and tried for like 20 minutes. He'd get like partway through the alphabet. Finally, he got all the way through the alphabet saying it and writing it out. He had tried numerous times to write it out. He finally wrote it out and he was so happy. He was so happy. And um, he talked about his abysmal penmanship he pulled out of his hat. He said, you know, um, he called uh, his <laughs> his first grade teacher by her name, Sister Anthony Ann, and he called her a name you wouldn't, you know, want to repeat <laughs> <laughs> for his abysmal penmanship. Yeah. Um, and I had never heard him even mention her before. So, you know, how he pulled her out of the hat, you know, was amazing to me. But, you know, it was incredible. And then um, 
the next day, he could take a shower automatically. He didn't need step-by-step instruction. He picked his clothes out. He put them on right. And, you know, just very quickly, 24 hours, there were noticeable differences. And then... And this was off of one 25-gram bolus, one third 25? Well, Todd suggested and Dr. Veach suggested we give him 20 grams three times a day. Okay. So it was a pretty hefty amount. Yep. And then we upped it, I think, a couple of days later, just a little bit to 25 grams three times a day, somewhere around there. And he, um, you know, uh, basically uh, continued to improve over six weeks uh, where he got back to where he was before we started the keto, before he started declining again. Mm -hmm. He stopped wandering. He, you know, was able to do things out in the yard again and, you know, um, just functionally, you know, he could read a menu and choose something off a menu, which he hadn't been able to do for a while. And, and he just said he felt good and he felt like he could do things. And, you know, that was one of his things with Alzheimer's. I can't do this anymore, you know, and now I can do things again, you know, so that was what changed. So his lights came back on. He was lucid. Yes. So you felt like you had your husband back for that, for that time. And that was another 20 months uh, that he was stable, you know, that he improved and then he leveled off and he was stable again for another 20 months, you know, which was really quite amazing. Um, so, um, it, you know, it, he, we had at various times, you know, he ended up taking it. Uh, my husband, um, many people might not know this, but he did pass away from Alzheimer's in 2016. So this was about six years after he started the ketone ester. Um, he started having seizures in 2013, and he fell the very first time. He fell back and hit his head, and he um, stopped breathing. He turned nice. blue for about 20 minutes. It was a 20-minute seizure. I had just left home. I was at the hospital. His caregiver called me and said she had called 911 and was waiting for them and that he was blue. And I got home. He was still blue when I got home. It was horrible. And he was unconscious, you know, when I got home. And um, they said he had another seizure on the way to the hospital. And, you know, Alzheimer's, that happens in Alzheimer's. And he happened to be standing and he had a hard surface with his head. And he never was the same after that. So he was dependent after that. We had to feed him and he was in a wheelchair much of the time. And um, we kept giving him the ketone ester. And we did, you know, <laughs> we had times when we couldn't get it. You know, the supply um, would run out. You know, they would run out of money to make it literally. And so we had a couple months where he didn't get it and saw a pretty big decline where he really couldn't lift his head up. Mm. And then Dr. Veach, you know, when he was able to get it to us again, you know, within a matter of a day or two, he was lifting his head up again, you know, which was kind of incredible. So even in the late stages, people ask me that all the time, could it help somebody in the late stages? And and I have numerous stories about that where people have improved, you know, um, with coconut MCT oil and now with these exogenous, you know, ketones, um, You know, uh, people that weren't talking that are talking and, um, you know, smiling again, making eye contact, things like that. Um, So it's really dramatic, you know, what this could potentially do um, for people with Alzheimer's. It's an incredible story. And I think we've seen some of our customers send in videos. And I think obviously very, very late stage. This is it's not a magical liquid that will bring someone from very, very late stage Alzheimer's back to normal. Right. I think there's the caveat and set expectations, but some of the videos have, you know, people, the caretakers will see that, you know, they can lift their heads up straight. You know, they can actually look people in the eye again, which for right. very, very late stage, stage dementia is, is definitely an improvement. But at a certain point, there is, you know, damage, chronic damage built up over time that you're not reversing all of that, but you can rescue some of that brain energy deficit. I think during that early, early phase, it would have cost thousands of dollars per dose of ketone ester. So, yeah, uh, I think the cost was um, $600 a liter or a kilo that they were making, uh, making it. So um, that's, let's see, a kilo is two pounds about roughly. Yeah. yeah. And you would need that much at the amount that Dr. Veach felt people needed, you would need that every 10 days, yeah. you know? So it was expensive, the raw material. Um, uh, but, you know, uh, one question I have, and you might be able to tell me this, um, you know, I, we didn't know if we were giving Steve 
if he needed as much as he was taking. You know, right. we did ketone levels. By then, there was a ketone meter we could use um, to check his ketone levels. So we experimented with dosing uh, anywhere from, you know, 20, 25 grams up to 50 grams. And 50 grams uh, got his ketone levels up to 7 millimoles <laughs> yeah. at an hour, you know, uh, yeah. somewhere around 45 minutes or an hour. And uh, so we ended up settling on usually 25 um, grams a dose. And, um, you know, after his seizures, Dr. Veach said, let's push it. And we actually had him up to, um, I think, 150 grams a day, you know, for a little while to mm-hmm. see if it would make a difference. You know, um, and he did. He did. I mean, he did get to the point where he was up walking about again, you know, just most of the time he had to be on a wheelchair. He just needed a lot more help after that. Yeah. He did improve, you know, after that um, seizure. But, um, you know, we, uh, I, I hear of people today who are taking five or 10 grams even once a day that are reporting improvements and, um, you know, and their memory may be functioning somewhat better. So I yeah. just wonder what you've heard about that. So I think in terms of dosing, there's the body weight uh, component. Obviously, mm-hmm. the bigger mass someone has, uh, the more ketone ester is needed to elevate the blood levels to, uh, to a level that uh, – a substantial portion of your brain energy mm-hmm. deficit is potentially recovered uh, in a in a in a brain with some sort of glucose uptake dysfunction. Um, mm-hmm. So we've seen folks uh, report in with around five or ten grams of ketone ester, getting their blood ketone mm-hmm. levels to around one one and a half millimole ketone. Yeah, that's what I've heard too. Mm-hmm. Which is consistent to your experience with MCT oils and coconut oil, if you've seen benefit from having a mild elevation of ketone levels to 0.5 or 1.0, then a, a micro dose, if you will, of ketone ester could get you that equivalent level. So um, I, I think this is where it's sort of cutting edge research where we're working with folks like Stephen Kunain up in, in, in Canada looking at, well, what is exactly the level of dose that you'd need? Is it more of a millimole? You know, what is a minimum millimole of ketones uh, in the blood that would start use uh, that would enable the brain to use a substantial portion of the brain to use ketones as a fuel? Um, and I think that's where uh, Science is yet to be done, but we're excited to be to contribute to part of that. Yeah, I think he's going to do a stepwise study. You know, start uh, maybe at ten grams, you know, two or three times a day, and increase from there. Um, I've gotten a chat with him a bit about that, but um, the amazing thing to me is the Alzheimer's Association didn't want to have anything to do with this idea in 2008, and then um, about two years ago, they actually came around to funding a study of MCT oil with Dr. Kunain for uh, mild cognitive impairment to see if it could prevent advancement to Alzheimer's, and that study's, uh, they're halfway through, and it's about to be published, and the results actually look good, you know, with uh, about 30 grams a day, which is two tablespoons of MCT oil, and they um, felt that probably 45 grams would be even better. But now the Alzheimer's Association is going to fund the study of a ketone ester, the ketone ester, which, uh, you know, here we are, let's see, 11 years after I tried <laughs> to get attention for this, but they're going to fund a study. And, um, you know, he has an opportunity, you know, like you say, he can start people on a lower dose. And I do think, you know, they may be able to determine, you know, uh, maybe per kilo, you know, how much, uh, what you know, at what dose will a person achieve the max, the minimum benefits and the maximum benefit, yeah. you know, above which more ketone won't help, you know, yep. possibly. Um, so I think it's just going to be an amazing study. I'm sure it'll take a year and a half, two years. He seems to do a, a great job of recruiting people quickly yep. uh, to his studies. He gets the studies done, you know, um, you know, quite well and just keeps at it. And, um, you know, what he learns from it is just incredible. They're going to do cognitive testing um, and they do ketone and glucose PET scans. You know, they can see how much ketone is taken up by the brain, uh, which is amazing. Yeah, he's one of the first folks that really has a method down. Yeah. Is it vindicating for you to see the academic world turn around to what you proposed and realized yeah. 10 plus years ago. <laughs> I mean, it must feel, it must feel like, uh, rewarding. I, I mean, I, how, walk me through how the feeling and, and, and what were, what were some of the title shifts that, 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 that made this change happen? Well, Kunain's work, I think, you know, it's proof of concept when you can show you take MCT oil 
and it does increase ketone uptake in the brain. Mm -hmm. And his other landmark study, you know, I feel is um, when he was able to show that ketone uptake is normal in the Alzheimer brain. It's, you know, that, that the very same areas that have decreased glucose uptake take up ketones normally. Mm -hmm. And, you know, ketones don't need insulin. They, they go in by a different pathway. The apparatus is still there in Alzheimer's, you know. So, you know, this uh, is a proof of concept that Dr. Veach's idea that it could help Alzheimer's, this is proof that, yes, it, there's every reason to believe that it can. And then now he's done studies showing that they they do have cognitive improvement, and this is with lower levels, you know, um, 0.5 millimoles, you know, from MCT oil. Um, so now he has the opportunity to look with the ketone ester. So, um, you know, when I, uh, to me, you know, when I first heard about Dr. Kunain and what he was doing, and it was before he published the study about Alzheimer's, you know, the ketone uptake being normal, I was uh, following him in contact with him and telling people about him everywhere, you know, trying to get his message out too, you know, because I felt it was really important. And um, uh, I, I would say, you know, so that that was really a landmark uh, thing. Uh, Dr. Veach uh, published a paper um, about as a transgenic um, model, mouse model of Alzheimer's. Right. And so this is a mouse that makes uh, amyloid plaque tangles and has cognitive deficits right. that they studied. And, you know, they used the ketone ester and they found compared to the controls that they did have less uh, plaque in the brain, I believe also less uh, tangle in the brain. Hmm. Um, and they had um, uh, less anxiety and they did have some cognitive uh, benefit from it um, in the mouse study, right. you know. I would also call out your, 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 the paper you wrote and you co-authored with Richard Veach. Oh, uh, yeah. That, I think, was very exciting for me as a, a reader and a follower of, of, of the space because this was – a, this was an and this is a human, right? Like you can say yeah, we are yeah. not mice, right? This was the first person, yeah. There's a lot of mouse studies that have shown potential for a num a number of diseases don't that yeah. don't pan out in humans. So I was excited to see that actual very very strong results from 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 your work, right? And I got to do part you know part one and part two, the medium chain triglyceride response, and then the ketone ester response. How it really um, brought him back around again to be able to get higher levels of ketones. I thought that was, you know, an important part of that. Um, and yeah, for me to have my name as first author on a paper with Dr. Veach and <laughs> and uh, Dr. Van Italy. Oh my gosh, that was just so amazing. Um, but, you know. Incredible. <laughs> Dr. Van Italy recently said, we should write another paper. I'm like, okay, I'm ready. <laughs> so it's just been an extraordinary experience. I never, you know, imagined. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm getting, I mean, I started talking in health food stores locally. And um, a podcast here or there, I mean, after my book came out and after it got on uh, 700 Club, you know, so it took a while, you know, for that information to kind of get out there. Yeah. But now I get to travel everywhere. You know, there's interest all around the world. You know, Alzheimer's is, is an epidemic. It's been increasing everywhere. Um, for example, Singapore, a beautiful place, clean, modern, beautiful place. Um, and they have had a... Um, it's a 300% increase in early onset Alzheimer's in the last five years, 300% in five years. And so wow. they are worried about this. And so, you know, um, when somebody hears about, you know, uh, this possibility that ketones could provide fuel and could help, I, I will get an invitation to come and speak, you know, and, and I have an opportunity to get this message out in a new place, you know, yep. a new country um, to people that, may not have heard about this before. Right. And uh, that's very gratifying to me. And um, it's just been incredible. <laughs> yeah. So we've talked yeah. around the mechanism a little bit, but it might just be helpful for our audience to just make that very, very explicit. So yeah. obviously we've seen in a number of case studies, you know, you know, it's the case study of Steve and all the supporting work that ketones can rescue brain function in Alzheimer's patients. So right. why is that? What is the mechanism of action here? Well, the immediate action is fuel, that it provides an alternative fuel to the brain, to glucose, um, and the brain instantaneously can switch from using glucose to ketones. The apparatus is there. They've, they've looked as early as the 12-week fetus 
you know, the enzymes, everything is in place to be able to use ketones. Um, and it's still there in people with Alzheimer's. And I think the immediate response we saw with Steve was prob- probably related to fuel. Mm-hmm. But he continued to improve steadily and very ex- much over a year. Um, and so another thing that has been learned since then is that it's an anti-inflammatory. Uh, ketones are anti-inflammatory. Um, Dr. Veach said that, you know, but there's much more proof. They've been able to identify where, um, you know, how it affects the uh, inflammasome. Right, NRLP3 inflammasome. Right, and it increases the scavengers of free radicals. It suppresses the production of free radicals, you know, so de- several different anti-inflammatory mechanisms. Um, and a disease like Alzheimer's and virtually all of the neurodegenerative diseases, autism, diabetes, arthritis, lung disease. I mean, so many diseases have as a feature inflammation. Um, Like in Alzheimer's, they have found recently that you can have a bunch of plaque in your brain, but you don't have Alzheimer's unless you also have inflammation Mm. in the brain, you know, which is interesting. So I think that the anti-inflammatory factor, you know, very likely played a role, you know, also uh, for Steve, um, in the the gradual improvement that we saw over time, um, yeah, coconut oil has other factors. Lauric acid, half of coconut oil is lauric acid, and right. it's antimicrobial. Uh, it kills numerous viruses, bacteria, fungus. So this is C10, lauric acid. C12, right. And C10 um, is also antimicrobial, not just just not quite as much as C12. And right. um, there are hundreds of papers looking at various microorganisms, more than 100 about herpes simplex virus that causes fever blisters on the mouth. Mm. Um, and, you know, people, they have found these organisms in the plaques in the brain. Um, and various studies, you know, where they've infected animals with herpes simplex and they develop plaques and tangles and cognitive deficits, you know, um, all kinds of studies, and also you know, sort of like ketones, the story about ketones, all of that's been suppressed. I you know, went to the last Alzheimer's Association conference, six-day conference, not a single session about infections and Alzheimer's. Hmm. They talked a lot about the microbiome. That's a new thing and how you know, the, the gut microbiome affects the brain, although they're not even looking. They're looking at the bacteria in the gut, but they're not looking at the changes in the brain, you know, there are microorganisms in our brain as we get older, right? you know, um, and so lauric acid, you know, may have helped suppress an infection in his brain. Um, Steve, um, he had an infection around his eye with herpes simplex when he was 29 and he never felt the same after that. And I thought, mm. I always felt like maybe that was a, um, a trigger, you know, why he got Alzheimer's so early and somebody that was so young and healthy and physically active and, you know, a novel reader and on a computer all day, you know, it, it didn't make sense to me that, it, you know, what triggers that? An, an infection is a very likely possibility. Right. So does your experience with Alzheimer's suggest a different understanding of the ideology of Alzheimer's? I mean, I think through a lot of my conversations, um, I guess the standard, uh, the status quo definition of Alzheimer's is some sort of amyloid or tau cause phenomenon. But I think right. within the conversations around the low carb ketogenic space, is this a glucose dysfunction, uh, uptake dysfunction problem with the, with the with neurons, with brain? So this is more of the type three diabetes explanation of why Alzheimer's happens. Um, but that seems to be just a subset of possible forms of Alzheimer's. Uh, would you say that Alzheimer's is more of an umbrella term for multiple multiple triggers, yes, of dementia or cognitive dysfunction versus one unified disease. Curious to unpack that story a little bit here. Dr. Veach and I talked about this forever, but even in the very beginning, we you know we talked a lot about this. You know that the plaque may be a downstream effect. Mm-hmm. You know. The metabolic changes, the problem with glucose uptake starts 10, 20 years before a person even develops symptoms. And um, they have done um, PET scans, uh, well, um, MRIs of people in their um, mid-20s who are at risk because of their family history for Alzheimer's. And already they have decreased glucose uptake in the brain at that point. So it's a very early phenomenon, these metabolic changes. And, um, you know, the plaque... um, 
seems to come later. It comes much later. You know, they, now they can do amyloid scans to look for plaque and they can do tau scans to look for tau. They don't see Alzheimer's it, even with a large amount of plaque in the brain until tau appears. And then it goes very quickly after that. Uh, tau is um, it's a protein that um, it's the structure inside the axons and dendrites that connect neurons. It's like the skeleton of the neurons, and you know, this this uh, uh, tau protein uh, seems to be attacked in Alzheimer's, and it wads up in, inside of the the, uh, the nucleus of the neuron. Um, it's really, uh, but you don't have Alzheimer's until the tau appears. They've learned this probably in the last two or three years. Mm. Um, and, you know, the inflammation is another important component. So when they look at these anal- amyloid plaques, I mean, people have talked for years about heavy metals possibly causing it, you know, like mercury, lead, cadmium, uh, aluminum, you may have heard of that, um, and then infections. And when they analyze these plaques, um, they have these bacteria, viruses, they have heavy metals in it, they have things like calcium carbonate, you know, which is in like Tums, you know, calcium supplements that, that so many people take. Um, and they have also learned that amyloid plaque is an antimicrobial substance. Hmm. It seems to be secreted in response to a microorganism in the brain, and they have found heavy metals in these plaques. So it seems like it's part of the primitive immune system. So it seems like there's some trigger that the plaque is responding to, you know, and not the other way around. I'm glad that you brought that up. I think that's, again, potentially, I think this is early. I I don't want to over-speculate here, but similar to how ketones are demonized early, is amyloid more of an ambulance situation where it is right. a response. At the scene of the crime. Right, it's yeah. a response <laughs> to some of these infection. And that's why all these drugs, these failed drugs that have been trying to target amyloid have failed. Yeah, they've removed it. They remove amyloid from the brain. The one Steve took yeah. um, was an oral medication that was supposed to help um, prevent further accumulation of plaque and possibly dissolve it. Right. And they've had, um, they, there was just another antibody um, trial. It was a vaccine that they could see that it removed all the plaque from the brain and there was no cognitive improvement whatsoever Yeah. by removing the plaque. So um, it appears that, and, and now all the big companies, Pfizer, uh, I think Merck and Lilly have all gotten out of the Alzheimer drug business. They've Spent millions and millions of dollars, billions. you know, going towards this dead end, yeah. and they're they're now out of the business. So um, they they're giving up, you know, basically, and so they need to look another way. And you know, um, the last few years, the Alzheimer's Association has started to stress prevention. Yep. You know, um, they've been trying to fix it after the fact by attacking plaque and getting rid of plaque. Um, it hasn't worked. And so what they need to do really is um, prevention. And, you know, so that's where the ketogenic strategies come in. Yep. You know, um, if you can keep those neurons functioning by providing fuel, um, you know, uh, the, the neurons are there. I mean, like like Dr. Kunain, um, um one of the big questions was, you know, when, when you look at um, – an MRI of somebody that has uh, Alzheimer's and a PET scan of somebody, there's these big areas of, you know, where there appears to be no brain tissue. There's like atrophy or shrinkage of the brain and also these areas of poor glucose uptake. And they thought the areas of, of poor glucose uptake were there because the neurons were dead, that the, they simply just weren't there to take up the glucose anymore. But he said, you know, the fact that the neurons can take up ketones, they are there. They're like cars that are parked that don't have fuel. They just need fuel in the tank and then, you know, they can function. And no doubt, you know, some of them, you know, many of them have died, you know, but we have trillions of neurons, you know, so we have a big backup system in our brain and, you know, it is possible even to grow more neurons. You know, doctors used to think that you you got what you got when you were a child and, and that those, you kept those same neurons forever. And now they're learning that it is possible to grow new neurons, like in the hippocampus, you yeah. know, where memory starts. Um, and, you know, it's just, uh, you know, very intriguing that the neurons really are there. They're just, the brain has shrunk. Yeah. So if we follow the the direction that, okay, there's some sort of glucose uptake dysfunction, do we have an understanding whether this is an insulin resistance of neurons 
or is it happening within the cell? For example, pyruvate dehydrogenase is somehow being inhibited. Um, do we have... There, there's several factors. Or maybe yeah. to open up a little bit, what are the contributing factors that's preventing glucose from fueling these cells and why are ketones able to shortcut or run in a parallel process into fueling this brain? And then when we, and I think it would be worth it to define for our listeners here that when we define fuel, we define it as a substrate for the Krebs cycle. Right, to make ATP. Yeah, so this is Every cell needs respiration. ATP this is the yeah. This is in the mitochondria. This is the power uh, the power plant of, the, of, of all of life. And you can either fuel the Krebs cycle with, well, you can fuel it for a number of substrates, but the two that we're primarily talking about right now, uh, glucose, which turns into pyruvate, or uh, ketones, beta-hydroxybutyrate into acetyl-CoA, and they feed into uh, the Krebs cycle. Right. One easy way to think of ATP is, you know, when you flex your muscle, every single muscle fiber needs ATP to do that. Yep. And to relax it again, every single muscle fiber needs more ATP. So you're constantly needing to make ATP for virtually every cell in your body. Yep. Um, and so there's this Krebs cycle that is a biochemical pathway that results in production of ATP, but it has to be fueled. So it's fueled, um, you know, by um, glucose, ketones, fatty acids can fuel it, but they don't cross very well into the brain. Yep. Um, so they're not a good source of fuel for the brain. So you know, basically for the brain, it's, you know, the, the main sources would be glucose or ketones. So um, the other thing, so, so several things happen in Alzheimer's that they've been able to document. One is insulin deficiency and insulin resistance in the brain. Um, so uh, another is the insulin receptors. You know, there's one group that has been able to show that the insulin receptors, which should be on the surface of the cell, aren't. Hmm. They're like, there's some kind of amorphous substance that seems to be trapping or preventing the insulin receptors from getting to the surface of the cell which is really interesting. So that could explain some of this problem with insulin resistance, that mm. the insulin recept receptors aren't where they're supposed to be, you know, in the cell. Um, pyruvate dehydrogenase deficiency. Um, so, you know, this is one of the enzymes involved in breaking down glucose so that it can enter the, the Krebs cycle. Um, that's deficient. And then uh, there are these GLUT uh, transporters, glucose transporters called GLUT1 and GLUT3 that are deficient in the Alzheimer brain. And GLUT1 helps get glucose into the brain, help cross the blood-brain barrier. And GLUT3 um, helps get glucose into neurons. So those are deficient, hmm. you know. So to me, it's like there's a conspiracy of getting glucose into the brain, you know. But ketones don't need any of that to get into the Krebs cycle to um, produce ATP. Right. The transporters are completely different. So uh, glucose mm -hmm. transporters, they go through what's called a monocarboxylate transporter, which is mm -hmm. completely separate from glucose uptake. Right. So do we have any speculation on what is causing uh, downregulation of glute transporters, PDH, pyruvate, dehydrogenase, insulin mm -hmm. receptors are, are downregulated? And, and I think that's an interesting uh, observation in the broader context of increased rates of metabolic syndrome, diabetes, all of these things. Uh, yeah. Can we speak towards the broader, I don't know if I want to say conspiracy, but the broader context of why all these things are accelerating? I don't know for sure the answer to that, but a very uh, large suspicion of mine is that it has something to do with what we're eating. <laughs> the last 50 or 60 years, um, obesity has been on the rise. Diabetes has been escalating. Um, if you get to be 75, in the U.S., three quarters of the people either have diabetes or pre-diabetes. Mm -hmm. It's astounding. It's happening in very young children, um, and you know we've been on this very high carb diet. Um, a, a huge amount of sugar we're eating. Um, there's some statistics showing back in like 1820s, people were eating on average six pounds a year of added sugar, which sounds like a lot. I mean, six pounds a year, geez. Well, now it's over 130 pounds a year yeah. of added sugar in the U.S. It's incredible. And um, trans fats, you know, uh, they're now in the process of being phased out in the U.S. They, they've been banned basically by the FDA. And in 2002, they started requiring food manufacturers to label whether there were trans fats in the food. So trans fats are these um, fats that are produced from um, subjecting oils to very high heat and pressure. And the structure, it actually saturates the fat 
but it also twists, you know, I think of it as twisting the molecule. It, it's, it's an abnormal shape. And yet these become part of cell membranes. They don't fit normally into the nice fluid cell membrane. They make the cell membrane stiffer. They shorten the life of the cells, you know, so trans fats, you know, have been out there, you know, um, most of us alive today, we're eating a whole lot of trans fat, you know, most of our life, if we were eating out, (laughs) eating at fast food places, ever, all that stuff, margarine, Crisco, I mean, Crisco was used constantly, you know, um, uh, I have a a lipid researcher friend at University of Maryland, and she said they used to measure, you know, in like a medium serving of McDonald's fries before 2002, 35 grams of trans fats. Whoa. Massive amount of trans fat, you know, and these are not normal fats. They're, you know, so I think that could have played a role. Um, I think, um, you know, it could be, you know, the sugar, you know, I wonder what feeds microorganisms, you know, why, you know, why do people get infections in their brain? Um, uh, you know, is this a fuel? We know it's a fuel for Canada. That's one of the the culprits that uh, has been looked at, um, I need to research more, you know, the different microorganisms and what fuels they use, (laughs) you know, um, the inflammation in the brain, you know, sugar, just really high, chronic, high levels of sugar produces what are called advanced glycation end products. Mm -hmm. And they're sticky substances. This happens when, um, you know, fat, uh, sugar combines with either fat or protein. And diabetics are very prone to getting damaged to many different tissues uh, from having chronically high levels of glucose. Um, so the inflammation in the brain as well, you know, can be attributed to that. And I think it could be a setup, you know, for infection. You know, if you have inflammation in any tissue, you know, uh, there's a good chance, or, you know, a reasonable chance that a microorganism will find that and try to grow on it, right. um, you know, produce an infection. So I, I do think, you know, uh, the biggest culprits are probably sugar, um, very possibly trans fats, um, and, you know, just getting away from eating a natural whole food, you know, uh, diet, um, which our ancestors ate. <laughs> they, they didn't have all these convenience foods that we have today. So many chemicals in our foods. Um, they've been genetically modified. We don't know how that factors in yet. Um, if it's important or not, it very possibly is. Um, the micronutrients, you know, we're eating like we say you take a vitamin supplement. A lot of those supplements are uh, synthetic vitamins. They're not the naturally occurring forms of the vitamins. Mm -hmm. So are we getting, when we do that, instead of eating, you know, vegetables, (laughs) you know, are we doing the right thing? Um, There's... um, you know, white flour, it's it's really pure sugar, you know, almost pure sugar. Um, and they've had to fortify it with um, B vitamins. The, the vitamin that they're using is called thiamine mononitrate, and it's not a naturally occurring form of thiamine, you know. Um, uh, the nitrate part of it, uh, it, it doesn't, it's partly fat soluble, which B vitamins usually aren't. So it could be stored in fat. It could be accumulated in fat. And when you think about the diet of the average American, probably almost every meal and snack, they have white flour, you know, almost every single meal and snack, you know, many, many people in the US, you know, so where does this vitamin go? If it's fat soluble, does it accumulate in the brain. I mean, I have so many questions. I think about this stuff, you know, I, yeah. I can't sleep some nights because I'm thinking about stuff. Well, I think you're just unpacking it. I think this is complicated. It is complicated. I think modern processed foods have saved a lot of lives in the sense that famine used to be one of the biggest killers and, right. and for better or for worse, we've resolved that problem. But now have we unpacked another can of worms here, which is that all these processed foods, which prevented people from star- starving to death, which is a good thing, but, but now are causing these chronic diseases that are now coming home to roost. And I think that's where I think folks like yourself, folks like ourselves, folks in the broader community are trying to change the paradigm now and where like, I don't think we blame processed foods for taking us from um, starvation, famine prone, species and society being able to feed everybody which i think which is good but that's just step one now that everyone is fed the problem is being overly fed and fed with non-optimal nutrition that is causing these chronic diseases can we now take uh the next step to evolve our food supply and our education there to a place that uh 
that, that doesn't let, let us starve to death, but also does not give us chronic diseases potentially. And hopefully that is you know, what we all work on together here. Um, so you've written the first book, which kicked off this, you know, this, this interest into ketogenic diets, ketones into Alzheimer's. I know you just recently published the complete book of ketones, which is over our shoulders. Right. Yeah, I've had a chance to uh, read through some of the key areas there. And I think it's one of the most comprehensive historical overviews on the history of the space here. And I think that uh, a lot of this knowledge is, is hidden in different podcasts or conversations like this uh, in the scientific circles, but it's uh, very cool to see all this, uh, I would say, oral tradition, this knowledge of ketone and ketone research in one specific area. So I know obviously you're out uh, getting the awareness out with the complete book of ketones, but what else is on your docket? What other projects do you have uh, in the works? I have three or four more books I would like to write. <laughs> <laughs> for one thing, you know, I think just, you know, continuing to get the message out there, you know, it's great to be able to do a podcast like this because it's that many more people, you know, that this information gets out to. But, um, you know, um, diabetes is such a big, big area. It's such a big problem. And people can reverse diabetes type two can be reversed with a ketogenic diet. People can get off insulin in a matter of days and off medications in a matter of two or three weeks with a, a ketogenic diet. Um, Dr. Eric Westman, um, I've heard him speak several times, but uh, at the last conference, he he's had over 4,000 patients now, type 2 diabetics that he's gotten into remission. They've lost 76,000 pounds <laughs> and, um, with a keto diet. And um, and now, you know, you know, the ketone supplements having, you know, exogenous ketones to be able to take you know, to boost ketone levels even higher, you know, than what, you know, we the average person is capable of doing with a ketogenic diet is really um, incredible, you know. So, um, I, you know, I've been a messenger for ketones since 2008, including the ketone ester. And to me, it's just extraordinary that it's finally here. It's available. You know, yeah. people can actually buy it and they can try it. And there is actually going to be a clinical trial starting soon for Alzheimer's, you know, for this ketone ester. Um, I just, you know, look forward to following, you know, uh, see, watching all of that unfold. And, um, you know, uh, I encourage people, you know, who are thinking about using it for Alzheimer's or any other medical condition to get their doctor involved. <laughs> um, there's some things about the ketone ester. For example, um, when, you know, whenever we check Steve's ketone level, we also checked his blood sugar level. Mm -hmm. And um, consistently, we saw his blood sugar level go down. And I do that same thing with myself. And I see my blood sugar go down. And right. um, so people who uh, are diabetic taking insulin need to know that. <laughs> they need to monitor their blood sugar closely um, so that they don't bottom out and get hypoglycemic, um, you know, while they're, if they're doing something like this, right. um, you know, there can be changes in electrolytes and things like that. So, I, you know, one of the big things I want to do is go out and educate doctors about this. <laughs> um, doctors still, I'd say 98% of them still don't know a thing about this. You know, they don't know about um, much about ketogenic diet. You know, like I said, even today, they're not really taught much about nutrition in school, much less about the ketogenic diet and right. its benefits. Hopefully that will happen soon. I think talking to a lot of doctor friends, they've gotten four hours of nutrition lecture yeah. over the course of medical school. Exactly. <laughs> and I had it one afternoon, one afternoon for about three hours was the extent of my nutrition training, which is why we were eating the convenience food diet for so many years. Yeah. You know? But, um, you know, just trying to, you know, get out there and educate doctors about food <laughs> um, and how to use exogenous ketones um, with their patients, you know, what they need to monitor, you know, what they need to watch for, um, how much to use, you know, what can t ketones do, what are the possible indications or applications of it, you know, and um, they're going to want clinical trials, you know, doctors like to see clinical trials. And rightly so. I think let's, if, if we believe in the science, then it should mm -hmm. have the results. So I have absolutely no problem, you know, helping make that happen. Right. If we if we think this works, then it should actually work in an RCT. Yeah. It should. The other thing too, it is a food substance. You know, it's it's considered a food. It's not a, a drug. It's not a harmful toxic drug. Beta hydroxybutyrate, the ketone that's used in, um, you know, uh, the ketone esters is R 
beta-hydroxybutyrate. It's the naturally occurring form of beta-hydroxybutyrate that we make from our own fat. So it's a natural substance. It's not a synthetic chemical that's um, produced in a lab um, and then you know uh, has numerous uh, potential adverse effects because it's synthetic and it's you know not a normal substance that we right. would have. Um, so you know, those are the kind of things I want to be able to educate uh, physicians about so that they understand it and so that, you know, they, they may have, you know, patients, you know, people with Alzheimer's, you know, like I said before, the brain is dying. There, there is no option. Um, when you look at risks and benefits, you know, perhaps um, it may be worth trying if the patient wants to try it. Doctors are allowed to use medications off-label. You know, they can use uh, ketone esters off-label. Um, but they sh- should become educated about it and, um, you know, just uh, use it with caution, I think. 100%. <laughs> and we'd love to support your work there. So how yeah. do folks follow along with uh, your work? I know you have a website that has a lot of resources there. Oh, yeah. Where do our listeners uh, continue uh, to learn about your your efforts here? So my uh, website is coconutketones.com. <laughs> I put that together at the end of 2008. You know, after Steve responded, I thought, okay, websites are getting popular now. <laughs> it was a pretty messy website, you know, for a long time. But um, I've uh, really worked a lot on it uh, the last uh, few months. Um, and so it's C-O-C-O-N-U-T k-e-t-o-n-e-s dot com and um, I have a Facebook page called um, Coconut Oil Helps Alzheimer's Dementia ALS Um, and so people can tune in there I'm going to probably have a new page soon that has a more keto kind of a title you know um, Dementia Prevention uh, should begin in our 30s <laughs> and uh, keto you know going the keto route is one way to do that uh, one important way and um, I'm talking about food and possibly exogenous ketones you know for people that are at risk um, uh, so I want to have a, a page that I'll hopefully have up soon at Facebook and um, I'm doing a series Facebook live uh, on Mondays through um, April and May uh, we're talking about my book chapter by chapter, sort of like a book club online. And uh, uh, the times are be posted, you know, on my um, coconut uh, oil helps ketones and on my ketone, coconut ketones website. Um, so, you know, and I have a lot of articles I've written about uh, the various types of uh, exogenous ketones and using, you know, in the elderly and people with medical conditions. I have that written up that people can actually read about it. Doctors can read about it. Nutritionists can read about it. It's a wonderful, inspiring story. So thanks so much for taking the time to share that with us. You're welcome. Thank you for letting me share it with you. Thanks so much for tuning in this week, everyone. If you want to learn more about HVMN and our offerings, visit www.hvmn.com forward slash pod. Also, by writing a review on our iTunes page and sending a screenshot to podcast at hvmn.com, we'll hook you up with $15 worth of HVMN store credit. Our last shout out goes to our listener survey, which lets us know who you are better so we can continue making episodes that you find most valuable. So visit go.hvmn.com forward slash podcast survey. For that, it'll only take a few minutes and new submissions are eligible for an HVMN ketone giveaway. So it's well worth the time. Until next time, study smart, train hard and live well.